Good morning, everybody. It's so awesome to see all of you here this morning, this Easter morning, smiling faces. Praise God that we're all here and He has risen. Um, if you just take a moment and we'll just pray together before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to, to praise and worship you, come to your house, Lord. Thank you for the gift of your son, Lord. For without him, we, we would be nothing, Lord. We praise you for that. We just hope that as the days go by, we can continue to look towards you, Lord, and to lean on you during everything that's going on in this world, Lord. For we know that you are in control, and we just need to lay at your feet. Lord, just pray for the message today, for our songs, that they might please you. And Lord, we just, we just let you out, Lord. All these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, our first song this morning is called, Because He Lives. And please join us if you know this song. One, two, three.
on uh, Friday. We're going to do it again. It's called It's About the Cross. Many of you might know this as a Christmas song, <laughs> but it actually talks a bit more about the Easter story. So we are doing it as an Easter song.
resurrection of his of his son. This is just an amazing thing for us to be able to be here. Um, looking forward to your message today and, and uh, I hope everybody has full tummies and don't fall asleep. <laughs> Sorry if I put them all to sleep with the food bag. Um, okay, um, so well the Easter lilies are up here already. If anybody took purchased one of these, if you want to bring it home after Easter, you can just kind of get it off of the you know off of the altar and bring it home. Um, Jackie's Attic um, still needs some volunteers, so if anybody's interested in putting in some hours at the community thrift store, um, Dan Triceman would be happy to hear from you. Uh, his number is here in the bulletin if you want to contact him. On Sunday, May 15th, we're going to have Adult and Teen Challenge here, um, and we will be having a sloppy <coughs> little potluck dinner downstairs after that. And that looks like about it for our announcements today. So, if you would join me in prayer this morning. Father God, once again, we just thank you so much for bringing us here today, Lord, and we just thank you so much, again, especially today, for the gift of your Son. We're thankful for that gift every day, but it just helps us to remember, Lord, and to drive home what you did for us, what he did for us, what you sacrificed, Lord, so that we could be free of our sins, so that we could be forgiven. It's impossible for us to live a life like Jesus did. It's impossible for us to live a life without sin, Lord. We're, we are sinful creatures. None of us, none of us, Lord, deserve to be up in heaven with you, but you sent your son down and he took the pain and died on that cross for us, Lord, so that we are clean, we are washed, we can be with you in heaven, and we just are so thankful for that. And we just, it's, it's amazing what you've done that we can't even comprehend, Lord, so thank you for that. 
I pray a blessing on the service, Lord. I pray a blessing on, on, on Mike's, uh, Pastor Mike's message today, Lord. And, and may everyone have a, a blessed Easter and just remember you and, and, and just be thankful for your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> we will be singing um, Christ the Rose. It's from the one very
Testament reading is from Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand there are pleasures forever. And the New Testament reading is in Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake quake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was that like lightning, and his garment as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they shall see me. This ends the readings. You'll stand with me this morning, we'll say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. baskets in the back and in the front here if you want to make an offering you can do it that way that said um, during this time we usually like to take a little time to give ourselves an opportunity to make praise reports if God has done something really awesome in your life in the past week Please share that with us, because we like to be able to encourage one another by hearing about what God has done in our lives. We also have this time 
so that if you've got a burden on your heart, something you're concerned about, you want to lift up in prayer together with the congregation, we also have the opportunity to do that now. So we take some time, and anybody who wants to can give a report or you can say a prayer together with the congregation. When it seems done, I'll close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for giving us your son, Lord, and knowing that he's here with us and always going to be around and here for us. Lord, I just pray for my friend's family. She passed away in her sleep on a Thursday night, Lord, or in Friday morning, they found her. Lord, I just pray for that family, and I just pray that you be with them this Easter as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for my cousin and Jenny's family. She had been undergoing cancer treatments and she had just finished her chemo and she passed away quite unexpectedly. So she's celebrating a wonderful Easter in heaven today, but her family's mourning her loss. So just be with them, be with her children, be with her husband as they try to navigate life now without her. But thank you that she is now healed and in your loving arms, in Jesus' name. Father God, we have so much to praise you for. Not only Jesus is taking our sin, the sin of the world upon him for us. But I pray that all these, all these situations and trials and tribulations and Everything that we go through would just lead us to you and help us, Lord, to, you've called us to be the light to the world and to share the good news about you, Jesus, and what you did on the cross. And help us to always be striving to do that, to do your will, and to just trust in you always. So nothing will shock us, nothing will shake us, our faith will stand strong. And I just thank you for, like it said in the re Old Testament reading, you promise us pleasures forever. And, and it doesn't get any better than that. And I just praise you, Jesus. Well, may the glory always be to you. Jesus, we love you. Father God, we thank you so much this morning for Jesus Christ, the fact that you gave him to this world, and the fact that he went to his death for us so that we could be reconciled to you, and the fact that you rose him from the dead. And now that because he lives, we know that we too will live again even after we die. And Lord, the fact that you did that also means that we have been reconciled to you. We are holy in your sight because of Jesus. And that means we can come to you. And you care for us and love us like a father caring for his children. And not just any father, but a loving, holy, perfect father. We thank you, Lord, that you invite us into your presence. And we offer all these prayers to you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, at this time we'll say 137. Christ the Lord is risen today. <coughs>
How many here in the last couple of years or so have heard the words fake news? <laughs> yeah, you've probably heard quite a bit. If you're on Facebook at all, you may have seen times where some post will be there and it will make some kind of claim about something and then you'll see this little message that Facebook provides saying, this has been checked by independent fact checkers and you know, all found to be false or whatever the case may be. And then you have to decide, well, do I trust Facebook to check that for me? You know? Or am I probably going to use my own brain and figure out whether or not I think that thing is true? Well, we're kind of living in that age right now where there is this battle over what is true. And we have different people trying to convince us what is true. And we have to decide, who are we going to listen to? You know? Are we going to listen to the people from whichever side trying to tell us, well, this thing is fake news, or that thing is fake news, or we've fact-checked this, and we've fact-checked that. And, and uh, but we also have to remember that we always have the option to look into things for ourselves. We don't have to just listen to what somebody tells us. We can do our very own investigating to find out what we really think and believe is true. So, my advice, throw away all the fact-checking, throw away all the fact, uh, fake news claims and all that, and think for yourself. And the reason I bring that up this morning is because it's really, really important when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we investigate that for ourselves and make a decision based upon our own study, our own research into things, whether or not we can believe that's true. Because if, as we believe, Jesus really did rise from the dead, that's a very, very important truth. In fact, it is the most important truth you will ever confront in your life. And you're going to have to decide what to do with it. Because if he really did rise from the dead, if he really is who he said he was, that has huge consequences for every person's life. And they have to decide what they're going to do with that. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, the Apostle Paul said, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Mind you, it was not uncommon among some Jewish people to believe that there was no resurrection. In verse 13, he goes on to say, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God, that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we won't either. What reason do we have to hope in the afterlife if there is no evidence that Jesus ever rose from the dead? Because if he did rise from the dead, then he conquered death. And he's living still. And we can expect the same for ourselves. But you know, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then there's no ultimate justice. This life is filled with massive amounts of suffering. If there's no afterlife, then none of that is ever going to be set right. Think about it. Painful disease, abuse, torture, murder, the death of children. All these things have no remedy no comfort, no justice 
if there is no afterlife. We'd just be left to think that all there is to life is all of that, all that suffering, all that hurt, all that pain, and maybe a few moments of joy along the way, and we just have to latch on to those moments of joy and enjoy those experiences because that's all that's positive that we would really get out of life. If there's no resurrection, there'd be no justice for those who do evil. No comfort for those who have suffered unjustly. The Bible teaches us that God is good and that he will set things right. Revelation 21, 1 through 5 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. If none of that is true, then we are, as Paul said, of all people, most to be pitied. But Jesus said there was an afterlife, and proved it by rising from the dead. So, again, the question arises, what will we do with Jesus? What will we do with Jesus? Did he really do the things they say he did? Did he really say the things they say he said? Did he really rise from the dead? This is really the most important question you will face in your life. Doesn't it make sense then that you should take time to study and investigate so that you can make sure this isn't fake news? If you just believe what somebody has told you about this, assuming that they know what they're talking about because they made a good argument, then you're massively selling yourself short because that's not a good foundation on which to stand. If you only believe something because somebody has convinced you it's true, then somebody else can probably come along and convince you that it's not true because you don't have a, a strong foundation underneath you. Regardless of whether you're believing he rose from the dead or not, you ought to be able to defend your point of view because sooner or later somebody will challenge your thinking. If you can't cite reasons for why you believe Jesus rose from the dead, Again, somebody else might be able to convince you that he didn't. C.S. Lewis had this to say about the question of what should we do with Jesus. Quote, he says, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, 
or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. What did Jesus say about himself? Did he claim to be God? John 10.30, he says, I and the Father are one. Who is the Father? The Father is God. And Jesus said, I and the Father are one. John 10.36 says, Then what about the one whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world? How then can you accuse me of blasphemy for stating, I am the Son of God? John 8.58 Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus had many I am statements. I am is, for, is how God referred to himself. I am that am. The Jewish people knew that. Jesus knew that. And he referred to himself that way. Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham lived long, long before Jesus lived. And yet here Jesus was claiming that he was before Abraham and using the term, I am. That's pretty clear. It's pretty clear to the Jews and they knew it and that's why they started picking up stones because they wanted to stone him. Because they believed he was blaspheming. Jesus also predicted that he would rise from the dead. Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus made claims to be God, made claims that he would be put to death, and made claims that he would rise from the dead. If you're a human being, and you're claiming to be God, and saying you're going to rise from the dead, you're either a liar, intent on starting a cult, a lunatic who doesn't know any better, or you are exactly who you say you are, and you'll prove it. Lee Strobel, an investigative journalist, used to be an atheist until he did a thorough investigation into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had this to say about what converted him to Christianity. Quote, In short, I didn't become a Christian because God promised I would have an even, an even happier life than I did as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following him would inevitably bring divine emotions in the eyes of the world. That's just his way of saying that people would think less of him, his atheist friends and such would think less of him if he began to follow Jesus. He goes on to say, rather I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved it, who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. You know, it's also worth mentioning that 11 of the 12 apostles went to their own deaths they were martyred, put to death, killed in all kinds of different ways because they would not deny Jesus was God. They knew he rose from the dead. They'd seen the risen Christ. And history records that all these men went to their death because they believed him. Now, these men knew Christ. They were with him. They walked with him. They lived with him for three years. They were there when he died. And they were around after the fact. 
It's one thing to go to your death believing something when you don't know the truth and you just believe it on faith, you believe it so you go to your death for it, but these men had to know the truth. They were there. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, they would know it. If they hadn't seen the risen Christ, they would know it. But they had, and they knew they had. So they were perfectly willing to go to their deaths for the sake of the gospel. It's pretty obvious then that C.S. Lewis was right. There's a lot of evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, and also that he rose from the dead, and he fulfilled the things that he said about himself. It's your choice then. You can investigate the truth with an open mind to see the evidence that exists, or you can dismiss him as a liar or a lunatic. But you can't just say he was some good moral teacher. Because if he was a liar or a lunatic, he can't be a good moral teacher. Now, having said all that, we sang the song this morning called Because He Lives. Not the hymn, a different one. There's also a hymn called Because He Lives. And this is what I want us to think about as well. What are some of the differences it makes because he lives? Did you know that the resurrection turns pointless chaos into constructive hope? The tragedies of this life, the injustice we see, the hardship, the suffering, the loneliness, the brokenness and fear, can tear at us psychologically, right down to the core of our being. If we don't know God and we don't have hope that in the future God will make all things right, then we become desperate and often turn to many desperate things to numb our pain. Why do you think the world is so full of people who are addicted to things? People are addicted to things like alcohol and drugs and, and uh, sexual immorality and just all kinds of things because they're looking for something to fill that emptiness, that void that exists in them because they don't know God, and they don't have hope, and they think that all the pain and suffering and tragedy of this life is all there is, and they're looking for a way to deal with it, because they don't have hope that in the future everything will be made right. And even sometimes when we do know Jesus, we still struggle with that stuff, but it makes a huge difference and we have hope. I thank God every day for a new day of life and the opportunity to go out into the world and hopefully learn to love God better and hopefully learn to love my fellow man better and even love myself better. Without hope, we're driven by fear. You may have heard the saying that he who dies with the most toys wins. That's a narcissistic view, and it's rooted in fear. People just want to get the most they can out of this short life. And sadly, that kind of selfishness can be the driver of all kinds of sin. And it's easy not to care about how much our behavior affects someone else, when in our eyes, it's us that matters. We focus on ourselves, and we seek out our own benefits and pleasures. But when we have our confidence in Christ, we, have, we come to understand that it's not every man for himself, but rather, it's God for every one of us, and in turn, it's every one of us for the welfare of each other. Jesus comforts us with these words from John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome 
the world. It cannot be overstated how much it means for us that Jesus has overcome everything that this world can throw at us. All the trouble, all the fear, all the hurt, all the pain, and yes, even death. He who dies with the most toys still dies. So make sure you die with Jesus because ultimately that is how we win the game of life. You don't win by having the most toys. You win by knowing your creator and making peace with God. The Apostle Paul gives us this assurance in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. There are no assurances of good like that coming for those who deny Christ and live for themselves. But for those who love God and trust in God and in the finished work of Jesus Christ, his life, teaching, death, and resurrection, there is the assurance of good to come. A time coming when we will see and understand why God allowed everything to play out the way it did. And the ultimate good that was accomplished. A time coming when all will be made new and right. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. <coughs> the gift of life that we have been given is not complete until we take the hand of the Savior. Without him, we walk through this life with a huge emptiness in us longing to be filled. We are like lost children wandering around. But once we make that connection, once we discover that purpose and that destiny for which we were created, life begins to make so much more sense. This is the thing you have to understand this morning. You have a purpose and a destiny in Christ. God made that for you. And you can live into that purpose and destiny, or you can live into self. But when you live into yourself, it's much more likely you're going to go down a path that's going to lead to bad things and no hope. Doesn't mean we won't have struggles. It doesn't mean everything will become easy. But it does mean that the hard times will pale in comparison to the greatness of the eternal glory that awaits us in Christ Jesus. Life is hard, no matter what. Jesus said that, in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Life is hard, but it's harder without Jesus. Jesus makes it all worth it and makes it all make sense. If there is no resurrection, then we have no hope for anything beyond this life. And life ends up being a pointless mass of chaos and pain, followed by the nothingness of death. I want you to think about that this morning. If you have to deal with all the chaos and pain and emptiness and hurt and suffering in this life, and then you die to nothing. You die and it just all goes blank. It's like you never existed. It all meant nothing. That's life outside of Christ. All the joyful experiences that you get in this life will pass away like a vapor. Because that's what you are. In the grand scheme of things, in the scope of time, you are like a vapor just waiting to pass. 
And all that pain and sorrow, all that hurt and emptiness would have no answer, no justice. But if Christ is indeed risen from the dead and alive today, then we have every hope, every promise, and every assurance that all things will work together for our good and that we will live and reign together with Jesus for all eternity. The evidence is there for all who will seek it. But it isn't about, it's, it's not just about the evidence. Because faith brings to light things that cannot be perceived without the Spirit of God. When we trust in Jesus, the Spirit of God comes to live in us. And we can see things we couldn't see without it. Those who truly believe experience God's Holy Spirit working in them. There is a knowing that runs deeper than anything any evidence could ever uncover for us. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Christ is risen from the dead. I encourage you, if you don't believe that, go seek those answers for yourself. <coughs> don't wait for somebody to tell you whether or not it's fake news. Don't wait for somebody to fact check it for you. Go out, dig deep, find the truth. Because the evidence is out there, and the evidence just might lead you to faith. And if it leads you to faith, then you will truly understand. Christ has risen from the dead. He's risen indeed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made it so clear for us that this world is full of the evidence we need when we have skeptical minds and hearts. We thank you that you Give us every opportunity that you are so patient with us. Lord, help us. Help us to desire, to know you, to know the truth. Lead us into that, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stand with me now, we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, at this time the praise team is going to come up and sing one more song for us called He's Alive. So if you guys have been here for prior Easter's, you know this song, you know that I've done it many times in the past. We're going to put a little bit of a new twist on it for you today. So we're going to do things just a tad bit differently.